Uh, welcome to Colorado State University's Paging Dr. Ram. Tonight we're going to be talking about wound management and all the different aspects of that, both from anatomy and um, all the diagnostics that you can do and then the therapy. So I am Dr. Swain, Elspeth Swain, and I am part of the um, CSU's ambulatory service. And I'm here today with a wonderful group of people um, to speak to you, one of uh, whom is Dr. Luke Bass and Dr. Alicia Yoakum. So if you two would like to take a minute and introduce yourselves, and then we'll get started. Cool. Thanks, Dr. Swain. Um, again, like she said, I'm Dr. Luke Bass. I'm here with the Equine Ambulatory uh, Service at CSU. Uh, finished veterinary school here now eight years ago and practiced at Pioneer Equine Hospital in California for a period of time and returned back to Fort Collins two years ago to join the Equine Field Service team. Uh, very happy to be part of these Google Hangout sessions. This is the third one that we've done and have, um, have done quite well. So thanks again for joining us and um, I will turn it over to Dr. Yoakum. Hi, I'm a Dr. Alicia Yogum. Um, I'm also part of the CSU Equine Ambulatory team here in Fort Collins. I graduated from UC Davis in California and did an internship at a private practice in Virginia before coming here. Um, and I'm excited to help everyone learn a little bit more about anatomy tonight. Thank you, Dr. Yoakum and Dr. Bass. And I, just a little bit about myself, I am from Colorado originally and um, have got just gotten come back this last year and it's been great to be back. I took an internship year in Wisconsin and then three years of residency in California and in internal medicine and so it's great to be back. So Dr. Yoakum is going to get started with the anatomy section of wound management. So Dr. Yoakum, take it away. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about location of wounds in your horse and why some areas might be more important than others. So we'll start with anatomy. Um, we'll just kind of show a picture of kind of some important systems, body systems in the horse before we go to specific locations. So we have the skeleton, so horses have lots of bones and um, as you can see here, especially in their legs and their face, they don't have a lot of muscle covering their their bones there, so um, that's something we'll keep in mind as we go along. Um, muscles, horses have lots of muscles, um, and as you can see here too on their lower limbs, they don't have a lot of muscle cover um, over their bones and their tendons and ligaments. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the abdominal cavity and um, why wounds underneath the horse might um, involve the abdomen more than we think. Um, the respiratory tract we'll talk about a little bit as well. We'll um, briefly touch on some wounds that have involved some, some vessels and nerves. Um, and this is just kind of a picture to show you um, briefly that there are a lot of vessels in the horse and so wounds can involve those. And we'll start with the head and the neck. Um, so Horses have large eyes that sit on the sides of their heads and they like to explore things with their nose and their muzzle and so these are a couple of locations that are commonly involved with wounds in our horses. Um, eyelid lacerations are pretty common again because the eyes sit big on the side of the horse's head and it's really important that if you see a laceration or a wound like this in your horse that you get it treated um, very quickly because as you can see here, we can repair the wound so that the eyelid goes back to sitting exactly where it was before and the eyelid is very important in the function of the eye and so if it's not put back together as accurately as possible, the, the function of the lid can be compromised. Another thing that often happens with horses with eye wounds or eyelid lacerations in this case is that they can develop corneal ulcers. Um, so this little green is a stain that a veterinarian put on this eye to find an ulcer. And often when horses' eyes are injured, they develop these ulcers. And these also need to be treated quite quickly and aggressively by your veterinarian because corneal ulcers can impact the vision and the, um, the health of the eye itself. 
So head and neck continued. We have lots of vessels, lots of vasculature, arteries, and veins on the head, as you can see in this drawing. And these are just a couple examples of wounds that involved pretty large vessels. This um, farthest to the right image, you can see obviously that that vessel was just very prominent and obvious that it was affected. But the picture in the middle, this horse wouldn't bleed unless its head was down. So there was a large vessel involved that had been severed, but when the horse's head was up, it was sort of occluded or um, stopped by the muscles and the bone in the head. So just important to have these wounds really thoroughly evaluated. Horses have lots of nerves as well on their face and their head, and the facial nerve is this big yellow one in the drawing. And it's very close to the skin, and so if a horse is injured, and that nerve becomes injured, they can develop what's called facial nerve paralysis. In this image, you can see the horse's left ear and his nose are both kind of drooping. And so when they develop this condition, they can have other complications as well, including that, again, going back to the eyes, their tear production may not be as, as good as it was before, and that can predispose them to corneal ulcers as well. So again, anything that looks abnormal on your horse's face after a wound happens should be addressed by your veterinarian. The horse's skull or the bone of the, the bones of the head itself are large and they have these large air-filled pockets called sinuses and they're on the sort of front of the face and on the side. And some more severe wounds like this one on the right can actually involve the sinuses themselves. So again, these are important anatomical structures to the horse and do need to be looked at by your veterinarian. The horse's trachea and the esophagus are very crucial to the, to the life of your horse. And um, if they are compromised in a wound, that can be very serious and potentially life-threatening. And so I just wanted to kind of show how the trachea and the esophagus run on the underside of the neck. And so wounds that happen on the underside of the neck may be more, um, more rare, but if they do occur, they can be quite severe. The horse's thorax, or the chest, um, which includes its lungs and part of the respiratory tract, wounds that occur in this area are, can also be very serious. And this yellow outline shows kind of the outline of where the lung would be on a horse. And both of these wounds um, are or potentially could be involving the internal structures of the thorax, which will put the horse into very severe respiratory distress, breathing very hard, very agitated. And these require very immediate veterinary care and attention. The abdomen of the horse, or basically the, the part of the horse that contains all of the intestines, and gastrointestinal functions are much closer to the skin than maybe we realize or you guys might realize. And so I just kind of wanted to show both with these pictures that um, a wound that happens on the underside of the horse's belly or up into the groin region, like in this picture with this stick, may involve the abdominal cavity itself and may potentially also penetrate into uh, intestine itself. And so these can be quite serious and do require veterinary care to make sure that this hasn't happened to your horse. They can develop um, infections of the abdominal cavity. They can develop um, hemoabdomen, which is when they bleed into their abdomen itself, both from trauma that goes directly into the abdomen and then also from blunt trauma to the outside of the horse. Limbs, um, as we all know, horses' legs can be quite fragile. And so we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the bones and joints and other structures of the limbs of the horse. These two images, the one on the left with all the bones, is the front, all of the bones in the front leg. And then we have all the bones in the hind leg. And in this picture, I kind of wanted to show how, where the bones exactly go on the horse's legs. And so here we have the front leg bones in line with this horse and then the hind limb bones. And so where the, where the bones meet are the joints. And if we ever have a wound that goes into a joint or another synovial structure, which might be a tendon sheath or a bursa, 
these are um, very, need very immediate veterinary care and need to be treated very aggressively as soon as possible. Um, wounds that go into joints or bursas or tendon sheaths can wind up leading to compromise of those structures and eventual potentially lifelong lameness. And so we want to see these as soon as possible and treat them as soon as possible. Some of the names of the joints we have on the front leg, the shoulder, then the elbow, and the carpus, which we often call the knee, um, in the upper part of the leg. And then in the hind leg, we have the stifle and the hock. The hock is also called the tarsus. Um, you may have heard that term. And then both, both have the fetlock, pastern joint, and coffin joint as the lower three joints in the horse's leg. So I wanted to show some example pictures of wounds that occur in the lower limbs of horses, and these are all wounds that have involved either joints or a tendon sheath. And <clears throat> this first picture, this wound involves the coffin joint. In this second picture, the middle one, the wound involves the pastern joint. And this third picture on the back of the leg involves the digital tendon sheath, which there's a little drawing over here on the right that shows kind of the extent of that. And it, again, like I said, is a synovial structure. It holds the deep and superficial digital flexor tendons within it. And if it becomes compromised by a wound, that can very um, significantly compromise the horse's soundness if it's not addressed quickly. The carpus and the tarsus, again, the tarsus is also called the hawk. I just wanted to show how sort of complicated these joints can be. They all have multiple layers of joints. And then in the, the drawings, the little green tube-looking things are more synovial structures that contain the tendons and ligaments as they run down the leg. And so any wound to your carpus or your tarsus, also called the hawk, can be very serious and involve any one of these little structures. So the horse's lower legs have tendons and ligaments, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with, either can become damaged with wounds or just from exercising your horse. And so um, it's important to, to know the extent of how those structures have been injured as well. And then you can also see in this drawing how close the bone is to the skin surface and that there's just not a lot of muscle or anything really covering it. And so when bones become compromised in wounds, they also need to be treated aggressively and, and addressed quickly. This middle picture of this horse had a wound that compromised its deep digital flexor tendon and ruptured it, and that causes the flipped up appearance of the toe. And this last picture, this wound, maybe on superficial appearance, doesn't look very deep, but when we looked closer, it does. It looked like it involved the suspensory ligament and maybe some others, other um, soft tissue structures. And then it also wound up having a fractured splint bone. So Again, the bones are very close to the surface, and um, these wounds can be more significant than we might realize on first glance. Another thing that horses like to do with wounds is develop proud flesh or excessive granulation tissue. Especially in their lower limbs, they have lots of motion, they're always moving. And so when they heal, they don't have a lot of skin often to cover the wounds to start with, and so stitching them up is not always very easy. And so when they heal, they develop this excessive tissue, and it does wind up needing to be trimmed away by your veterinarian so the skin can eventually close over. And um, this middle picture is shows um, a nice image of, of proud flesh, and then the first one, that's how the wound looked on the first day we looked at it, and as it healed, it developed this bed of, of proud flesh over it. So just an example of how these wounds heal, and they kind of wind up needing prolonged care as the wounds heal over time. And then briefly, I just wanted to show a few pictures of wounds that can happen in other locations than what we just talked about, and how they may be, again, more significant than realized at first. This first wound was a stick that had got stuck in this horse's hip. And after looking at it further, we found that it had actually fractured the bone within the wound. Um, and the, the second picture shows um, a big laceration over the shoulder. There's a lot of muscle, which does heal very well. But it's a kind of a reminder picture of that 
in horses, oftentimes, even if we fix the wounds, there's so much movement in these locations that it can be hard for them to, to stay stitched together. And then the third picture is a horse that clamped its tail over an electric fence and just kind of wanted to remind everyone not to forget that the tail also has bones within it um, and that and these locations should not be ignored. Um, so with that, I will turn the, the slides over to the next lecture. Thank you, Dr. Yoakum. That was fantastic. I am going to now take it to um, what you can do diagnostically for wound therapy. Okay, so for diagnostics, uh, one thing to begin with is to, from, a, from your standpoint as the owner, but also from the veterinary standpoint, it is very important to be thorough when we're looking at a horse that's been injured. You can get very distracted by the obvious and the big, larger wounds and maybe miss something that's more important and more significant. This wound um, is, uh, happened over a, a knee and um, there's a tiny little puncture that has occurred um, right there and that can be um, more significant to the horse in the long term than the wound, the larger wound on the chest. We begin uh, our first assessment with horses at, with wound preparation and so this involves clipping of the hair and um, one thing that is very helpful to, to when we're clipping the hair is to protect the wound itself and we can add uh, surgical lube to the wound bed so that the hair doesn't stick to the, the wound when we're clipping, which is really nice, especially in the winter time. And then cleaning of the wound really helps us and oftentimes, especially in rainy weather, it is um, in muddy weather, it's mud caked and very difficult to see how deep or extensive a wound is and so taking the time to clean the wound um, before um, if in order to assess it is really important. Some of this you can do very safely with just cold hosing if the horse is good for it and then using gentle soap and water can help the, you see how deep the wound is itself and, and determine how severe it is. And then um, one thing I sort of remind you is uh, with any type of wound preparation is to be safe and pay attention to your horse and its, um, and its sensitivity. Most of these wounds can be very painful, especially if they've just occurred. And so just a reminder to stay very safe and, and use a veterinarian um, if in doubt at all. Another thing that we can assess is the, the contamination of the wound. Is the wound infected? And um, this wound on the left is a wound that has happened um, just recently within a few hours and then the wound on the right is one that's a little older and then has uh, a lot of drainage associated. This is when the bandage was taken off of the wound and that the bandage was soaked with, um, with some uh, debris and discharge and so it indicates to uh, the veterinarian that it is infected and requires um, other, other treatments. Another thing to assess is how old the wound is. Dr. Yoakum talked about the granulation tissue or the proud flesh that can develop in the later stages. So this picture on the right is a very new wound with sharp edges and the tissue underneath looks very uh, normal and, um, and, and does not have any proud flesh associated with it. So this is going to be a more acute wound. And then the picture on the left has a um, significant amount of fluffy pink material and, and that is the proud flesh occurring in an older wound. So that helps us gauge, sometimes if we can see the granulation tissue, it helps us gauge how old that wound is, how many days it's been. The location is so important, like Dr. Yoakum talked about with the, especially the lower limb, there are so many structures that can be involved and so uh, that we begin a wound exploration with consideration of all of the anatomy and, and the possibilities for um, complications to the, the structures that are around the wound. Punctures are especially tricky because they look so small from the outside 
and yet they can be um, they can tract underneath the skin and you don't really know where to, they are heading and so they can go into the deeper structures of the joint capsule or um, tendon sheath and um, and you may not know it until a few days later and so exploring puncture wounds is very important and then the more obvious wounds um, it's a lot easier to identify the structures that are involved and the larger the larger surface area helps you with that you can use instruments to explore the wound as a veterinarian and, and try to understand how deep the wound is and the extent. And most of this we do sterilely so that we don't tract um, with our probe more infection or contamination anywhere into the wound um, or to the deepest extent. And then you can identify what structures are possibly involved and what should you um, be considering as, um, as part of the therapy. There are many diagnostics that we can reach for uh, when things are maybe a little more complicated. And so uh, some of the things that we use as our guideline on when to look a little deeper at the horse is if the, the synovial structures are involved. And so that, like Dr. Yoakum talked about, were the joints or tendon sheath. Um, if the horse has a wound and then is also severely lame or develops an increase in lame it, lameness over the course of healing, and then another thing that we, we really consider with wounds um, and reassessing wounds diagnostically is when they're not healing appropriately, like you would expect. And then uh, tendon and ligament involvement too. Sometimes we have to use other um, techniques in order to identify the integrity of those structures. So to begin with, wounds over the synovial structures, this is a wound um, that has happened to the back of a front leg and has punctured into the tendon sheath. And so the tendon sheath has um, developed a severe swelling around it. And it, the wound itself looks pretty small, but the swelling is significant and likely the tendon sheath is infected. And so um, things that you can investigate is that you can actually sample the synovial fluid. So that's the fluid that surrounds either the tendons in the tendon sheath or in the joint cavities. Um, that's what kind of lubricates the joint and um, supports the health of the joint. And so you can actually do this sterilely and um, as a veterinarian you can stick a needle into the the joint and sample the fluid and you're assessing the color and the viscosity of the fluid wanting wanting to make sure that that appears normal and then also you can measure the cell numbers inside the fluid and protein as the cell count increases or protein increases then that indicates to you that the um, the horse has a, a compromise of the integrity of the of the synovial structure this is an example of the last picture was a very, very normal looking fluid and this is a more contaminated looking fluid and infected fluid. And so the fluid is thicker and it is um, a darker yellow. And so this is definitely something that you would um, want to culture as a veterinarian. Other things that you can do to assess the integrity of the joint are um, you can also distend the capsule of the joint by adding sterile fluid to the joint itself. And so you just expand the pressure in um, the joint and C is the fluid coming out of the wound. And so this joint that has a, a wound on the outside of the leg and the needle is going on the inside of the leg and the um, arrow is pointing to the fluid that's coming out the wound itself and that shows you that the wound has affected that fetlock joint. Even if all the structures appear intact, antibiotics can be injected into the joint that you're worried about being associated with a wound just to help protect the joint and give it a extra support. Other times that we look deeper into and use other diet forms of diagnostics are when the horse develops a moderate to severe lameness. So sometimes this can occur at the time of injury and then sometimes this can develop later in the healing process, even a few days later or a few weeks later. And so this can really help um, determine what is going on and give you an idea of how to proceed diagnostically depending on the time of onset. 
infection can occur um, with some of these uh, lamenesses, especially if they are occurring a few days after injury. And so that's something that we want to revisit uh, as veterinarian to maybe retap a joint or retest the fluid. We always wonder is there bone involvement, and especially with he wounds that are not healing. And then this uh, injury is to the inside of the hind leg, and then you can, when it was explored, you could see uh, tendons and ligaments involved. And so this may be something that you um, have to assess over time with ultrasound to try to see if it is um, the tendons or ligaments have been compromised. So to evaluate the bone, this was the case that Dr. Yoakum gave as an example. And um, this, this one, you definitely we were concerned about the soft tissue structures with the tendons and ligaments, but the lameness and the appearance of the wound and the horse made um, us take radiographs. And that x-ray was very important so that we could identify the fracture of the splint bone that you can see here. And so sometimes with the lame horses at the time of a wound, the radiographs can be extremely helpful. Other times that radiographs are used are in non-healing wounds. So this was a wound that occurred on a horse's leg um, it was a hind leg, and it was a few weeks after injury, and it was just a tiny little laceration, but it just wasn't healing appropriately. It still had a lot of granulation tissue and a little bit of drainage. So this x-ray was taken, and you can see a lot of reaction at the, um, at the arrow, side of the arrow, and that just is a fluffy appearance to the bone that indicates that the bone is involved, and, um, and it should maybe be considered as far as being infected itself, or the bone being infected, or having another problem. Other things that you can do to evaluate bone would be, in addition to radiographs, would be ultrasound. Sometimes you can evaluate the surface of the bone with the ultrasound. And then um, more advanced imaging would be CT or MRI. This is an MRI image of a bone and that um, the the middle bone has a white patch in it, and that bone has uh, in a lot of inflammation within that, and the x-rays were normal. And so very interesting that the um, that was the cause of the horse's lameness that just got a bone bruise. And then you can also use things like bone scan um, for more advanced or complicated cases. Using ultrasound to evaluate um, either the soft tissue or the bone is uh, very useful. And so this is an example of a non-healing wound that um, ultrasound was used to evaluate the surface of the bone. And the, the, on the picture on the right, you look at the white line running down the screen, and um, it kind of breaks away in the middle, and it should be a nice, clean white line all the way through. And so there's a pocket of infection and uh, also a little uh, sequestrum of bone that has not healed down and was injured in the original injury that looked pretty superficial. Other times that you use ultrasound are to evaluate the ligaments and uh, the tendons, and sometimes we have to wait until the inflammation is quieted down, and this can be uh, up to a few weeks after the original laceration or injury, and then we can assess adequately the integrity of the tendons and ligaments. So it just depends on the wound and, and the severity and how quickly that inflammation resolves. The non-healing wounds, the the most important thing is to re go back and repeat the diagnostics because infection can play a role, bone changes, um, deeper, deeper uh, pockets of bone bruising or injury, and also um, tendon or ligament injuries too. And so all of those things can, can really be important and change over time. Some fractures may not show up for weeks after you the original injury, and so repeating radiographs in order to try to find those structures can be extremely useful. And then certainly repeating cultures if the lameness is not improving or the infection does not appear to be improving despite antibiotics. 
And then um, certainly you can use advanced imaging to see further detail and um, there's so many structures in involved and so they're, they're, those can be extremely helpful too. This is a little tiny bump on the bone. There was a, a soft tissue injury and um, the horse probably got kicked and the bone got bruised and then a little section of the bone died around the, uh, the original injury and then sequestered off a piece of it. And so until that bone is cleaned up and, um, and that little section has been removed, that bone or that wound on the external aspect won't heal. So to decide when to call the vet, the, remember that it never hurts to call. It, we are always happy to at least troubleshoot or, and look at pictures if, um, if you have them and, and try to help you decide if it's indicated to have the vet out. And then especially call the vet though if you are looking at a puncture wound or the, your horse has a concurrent lameness in addition to your the, and a, a new wound, or if the wound has occurred over joints or any other structure that you would be concerned about with a synovial structure or tendon or ligament, and then certainly for non-healing wounds, because that can also, there are a lot of things that we can do to tr help troubleshoot and try to figure out why it's not healing. A reminder that you can submit uh, questions as a comment below as you're watching this um, whole presentation. Next up we have Dr. Bass and he uh, will be talking about wound therapy. Thanks, Thanks so much so Dr. Swain. Um, um, a great um, introduction to anatomy and diagnosis and, and why we do what we do with wounds. Now we'll conclude this session um, with wound therapy. Um, so just to begin, you, you've heard a lot about lacerations. They do come in all types and varieties. You can get something from a simple abrasion to something that involves tendons, joints, or major vessels and nerves. Um, to begin this part of the, the presentation, uh, we get a lot of questions about what do I clean my horse's wound with. Uh, we recommend using povidone iodine, which is called betadine. It's the gold standard. Um, there are many positive reports um, by using this. It has benefit of being an antiseptic, but it's also associated with having debridement as well. Um, there's been some studies that have shown that topical antibiotic sulfur cevodiazine, povidone iodine, are saline galls um, works, but the povidone iodine seems to be least effective in reducing bacterial numbers in the wound. So we like to use it. Um, we also um, you know, we'll follow it with, with antibiotics systemically and most likely topical, but it's the gold standard as far as, as what to clean a wound with when, when it happens or maybe, um, you know, after, after the veterinarian looks at it and, and assesses it and goes from there. Then from, from that point on, um, we, we probably need to assess um, what to put on the wound once it's, it's dealt with. Um, either after the veterinarian has sutured it or after you've taken care of it. There are a couple of products that we like to use. One is silver and it comes in, we call it SSD cream, but it's the sulfur sulfadiazine cream. Uh, it's used quite commonly in human burn patients, but we like it for certain wounds um, on the horse. The cream is removed and replaced at least once daily um, and there's been some reports that show that silver in horses uh, has less granulation tissue. And like you heard from Dr. Yoakum, granulation tissue sometimes can be the number one problem in horses that have distal limb wounds. Nitrofurazone, this has been around for centuries. Um, Nitrofurazone has been compared to the others and actually sh shows significantly slows the healing rate. Um, we recommend not using nitrofurazone for most wounds. Um, it does have a, a toxicity to cells. Um, and, it, and it just basically has minimal effect against the microorganisms that can cause infection. So at this point, we, we do not recommend using nitrofurazone directly on the wound um, as a wound ointment. One ointment most commonly used um, that we recommend using is what's called triple antibiotic ointment. It has neomycin, polymyxin B, and bacitracin in it. There's a huge benefit um, of this medication when used or when compared to other topical antiseptics. Um, antibiotics do help in working in a synergistic fashion, so they basically feed off of each other. 
one of the big things in wound healing or wound therapy is keeping the wound moist, keeping the environment moist. And so this this one product basically reduces bacterial numbers and is more beneficial than the others in stimulating wound healing. So at this point, we're either looking at using Neosporin or the silver for a topical wound dressing. A newer concept that has come out in the last four or five years is using Manuka honey. Um, there are several sources. Uh, you can either purchase this online from your veterinarian, but it works in several different ways. It's an antibacterial, works as an anti-inflammatory as well, and how it works is the high sugar content and basically the, the, uh, the makeup of the product helps draw edema or swelling out of the wound. It also pulls the water out of bacteria and is acidic. Um, in addition, it promotes wound healing and effective for proud flesh. So this is something that I have started using in the last four to five years um, that really helps provide a more natural approach to wounds um, and it's pretty readily available in most parts of the area. Sorry for the graphic nature on this wound. This was a wound that um, I saw when I was in California and you can see on the left picture it's a pretty significant wound to the uh, right fore ankle. You can see the cannon bone um, is visual here and um, it was in the digital tendon sheath there. And this is a picture three months later of Manuka honey um, and actually meat tenderizer, which I learned as a young a youngster to use on, on wounds. So you can see significant healing with this wound um, and nothing else was done other than the Manuka honey and the meat tenderizer. Like I said in the beginning, moist wound healing is very important. Um, a full thickness wound must be kept moist and usually will re-epithelialize or the you know, will start to close over in, t in 12 to 15 days. When compared to the same wound exposed to air will take twice as long to heal. So the old verbiage of it needs to be exposed to air may not play safe or may not play correct for, um, for our current wound healing. The other um, idea that I wanted to talk about tonight that a lot of people don't know as much about is the concept of foot cast. So as you've been hearing throughout tonight's sessions, we get a lot of wounds um, on the heel bulb area, around the coffin joint, or in, anywhere in the pastern, um, or around the fetlock. And so one option for these wounds, obviously after you assess to make sure it's not in a synovial structure, is to suture the wound and then place it in a, in a foot cast. And there'll be some pictures in the next slide that shows the foot cast, because this is just the light bandage. But what this does is this immobilizes the foot significantly for the first three or four weeks of healing. And so this speeds up healing and it allows you not to have to change a bandage two or three times a week like you would have to do in bandaging. And yes, there is a bit more of an investment at the beginning, but after the three to four weeks, your actual investment is the same when, when spending money on a foot cast versus the bandaging two or three times a week. So on the left, here's a picture of the foot cast finished. We have regular casting material and we use elasticon on the top and bottom of this. And this is actually a picture of, a, of the same horse after the foot cast has come off. So a little different wound that was showed in the previous slide, but you can see that wound is basically healed and the horse is almost ready to go back to work. So pretty impressive results for only three or four weeks of a foot cast. The other concept that um, was done on this horse recently is the idea of skin grafting. And I think Dr. Yoakum did a great job of talking about proud flesh and I'm going to, if it's okay, skip over basic wound care as far as bandaging goes. I wanted to get in and talk about some of the cooler things that we can do both in the field and in the hospital here at CSU. You can see this, this mare sustained a wound to her right hind uh, cannon bone region and this is just below the hock. You can see the cannon bone was exposed. This wound was sharply debrided um, and placed under a bandage to basically let a nice bed of granulation tissue heal over this wound. And due to the size and the time it would take to heal, the owner wanted to do skin grafting. And so we took the students down, um, did this in the field, and you can see um, this is the recipient site, and we've made some little punches in here and stuffed some little Q-tips to keep the bleeding down. And then we're going to take these, take these these donor sites from just under the main and we're going to stick them or plug them into the holes that the Q-tip is on. That was done and this is the wound about three weeks after after that procedure was done um, and the wound is actually healing quite nicely. I was just 
I'm unable to get the picture today for a more updated picture, but you can see taking it from where we started and where we finished, it's healed quite nicely and it's 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 done quite well. So I know we've we've touched on some ideas about wound care and hopefully we've given you some ideas about where wounds are bad, what to do with those wounds, what your veterinarian is going to do, and just a hint of what we're going to do. That this is a book that we all have. It says here for the equine practitioner, but anyone can buy this wound, buy this book. Uh, it was written by Dr. Dean Hendrickson, who is on staff here at CSU with us. It's a great resource for how to deal with these wounds, and it's a great resource for what to do if you just have questions. Um, and this is the source to get it from. Again, if, if you're not able to tune into all of this, this uh, session will be on YouTube um, for further viewing. And I think that concludes the, the presentation part of it. Um, I'll switch things over back to Dr. Swain, and uh, she, can, um, she can pose some questions that were asked by the audience. Thank you, Dr. Bass. That was great. Okay, so we have a couple questions that we're going to get started with today. The first is from Julie Dyer. She says, I have a gelding who has a swelling in the sheath area. I was told it could be due to lack of exercise. At what point does this become a big concern? He seems to be feeling fine otherwise, except itchy in that area. His pen has a drainage problem and has been muddy with all the rain. He was examined and cleaned out by my vet one week ago. No lumps were found, but the, there was a little discoloration noted. In your opinion, what might cause the swelling and what would be the best path to healing? So I'll answer that question. Um, there, it, it depends a, quite a bit on how old the gelding is and what breed he is. And so sometimes I, I get concerned about if it was a pain horse, about squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, if it was a gray horse, I get concerned about melanoma. But otherwise, older geldings have a, a really big tendency to get swelling in the sheath region and to have a hard time seeming to clear that um, swelling. It doesn't normally cause many, many problems for them at all. Sometimes it can get more pronounced and then kind of wax and wane. And um, certainly if this is something that is new, uh, sometimes I recommend blood work just to make sure that there's nothing else going on that you might need to follow through with. And then ha certainly having your vet do the exam recently was a good idea. So, uh, okay, there's a couple other questions. We've got, okay, this question, um, if my horse sustains a wound to the fetlock and it is bleeding a lot uh, and squirting blood, what do I do before I call the vet? Dr. Bass, would you like to head up that question? Of course. Um, great question. We, we see this or hear about this probably once a month or so. So when, when someone calls and says um, poses this question to us over the phone, um, I immediately know that you know, in the fetlock or pastern region, there's some pretty good uh, you know, sized vessels that supply the blood to the foot, and most likely the laceration has involved one of those vessels. I think the first the first recommendation I would give owners, um, you know, before you call and, and you know, kind of in a panic attack about the bleeding, is try to find something to cover it with, and, and that's not always easy because you may be on the trail or you may be at an event or you may be in your backyard and just don't have anything handy. But even something as simple as a a towel um, or a t-shirt or, or anything that you can apply pressure to the area and wrap that with, it would be nice to have vet wrap or elastic on, but if you, even if you had some duct tape, just get a nice firm pressure over the area. Maybe put the horse in a stall or a confined spot where he or she can kind of chill out until you can kind of regroup, call the veterinarian, but, but, um, but getting, you know, getting the bleeding stopped is great. I, I don't know if I would recommend giving the horse any medication um, at that point unless they're severely painful, but I think at least um, getting compression over the wound getting a bandage on it if you have the materials, but if not, using a thick towel or something to apply pressure and some duct tape at the least until we get there is, is a great idea. And then once we get there, then we can take it off and ligate the vessel and, and assess where, where things go from there. But that is, that is the recommendation I would give for that approach. Okay, thank you. Another question, uh, if my horse steps on a nail, what are the correct steps to take? 
Dr. Yogam, would you like to handle this question? Sure. Um, so if your horse steps on a nail, um, the first thing that you should do is not take out the nail. Um, we usually like to see the horse with the nail still in the foot, and that way if we take an x-ray, we can see where the nail track goes. If you do have to take the nail out, if you're going to transport the horse or you um, or feel the need to take the nail out for another reason, um, marking the area or trying to, to do something that will tell us where the nail went in is very beneficial. It's um, much easier than you would think to lose the nail tract. So um, call your veterinarian, <clears throat> leave the nail in if possible, and if you know, you're know you very far from your veterinarian, you could discuss with them whether putting the horse on a trailer and taking them to a clinic or taking them to your veterinarian is, is an option as well. Thank you, Dr. Yoakum. Okay, another question. My horse had a wound to the digital tendon sheath area. Should I rush him to the hospital or have a local vet see it? The, it, it, certainly some of this um, depends, I can answer this question, um, some of this depends on um, how close you are to the facility and what vets are available to you in your area. But definitely having a veterinarian take the first couple steps on, even on the farm it can be very helpful because that can sometimes, just that wound exploration um, that you can do on, on the farm with your veterinarian can rule in or rule out the involvement of the tendon sheath and or the other other uh, structures that could be involved. And so um, sometimes there can be even fractures or other things that you may want to stabilize first before transporting to the hospital. But um, if you don't have a veterinarian available and your only option is to take the horse to a referral center, then certainly that's something you can do. Okay, another question is on the trail, my horse got kicked and um, sustained a puncture wound to the hawk area. What do I do next in this situation? Dr. Bass, do you want to handle that question? Sure. Um, you know, I think it's the time of year when people are, are finally, you know, able to get out on the trail, um, enjoy their horses, and so this is something that um, we, we never want to hear from an owner, obviously, um, as unfortunate as it may be, but it, it does happen. So I think our first recommendation is to include a first aid kit with you, um, and that would include certain bandage material, anti-inflammatories, maybe some eye medication in case there is an eye wound, um, and, and definitely um, you know, some medication to help you along the way. You know, and, and from there, if you have that handy and, and you're, you're, you're near your trailer, it's easy. You can, you can bandage the horse and try to get it to the veterinarian, but the difficult situation arises if you're eight to nine miles in, you're, you're, you're go and something happens. And so I think as, as, as hard as it may be to, to take bandage material with you on the trail or take a couple of items in your saddlebag, that's probably the best, best thing to do in, in applying a bandage. Um, you know, if you had something to clean the wound, that's wonderful. But puncture wounds to the hock or, you know, even to the knee or, or any of the areas of the joint, as you've heard tonight, are a huge concern. So trying to get the wound clean and get it covered to prevent any further contamination would be the best, the best bet. And then um, if you had any but or banamine, you know, an anti-inflammatory, probably it's, it's a good idea to go ahead and, and you know, administer um, the proper dose of that until you can get get back and get down and get to a you know a local veterinarian or a referral center. So I think the point I'm trying to make is you know having having materials on the trail with you or you know while you're camping is is really handy and if you if you take them you'll probably never use them but if, if you don't then you'll you'll wish you had. So I think preparation is the key um, and then you know tr trying to trying to treat the wound as best you can to get get to that veterinarian is also probably the sec you know the second step and then we take it from there. Thank you, Dr. Bass. Okay, that wraps up our questions for now. And certainly you can continue submitting questions by clicking below or commenting below. And uh, we'll do our best to try to continue to answer any questions that you may have. And then you can view this whole presentation, all three of the speakers, um, in the future. It'll be posted on YouTube. 
you can find us there, Paging Dr. Ram, Colorado State University. And thank you so much for tonight. And uh, we appreciate all of the viewers and uh, ho hope all have a nice evening. Thank you.